So I just want to invite you to rise as we worship this morning. Let's read this passage. I'll read it. You don't have to read it out loud. It says this. This is from 1 Chronicles chapter 16. It says, Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Each day proclaim the good news that he saves. Publish his glorious deeds among the nations. Tell everyone about the amazing things he does. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. The gods of other nations are mere idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty surround him. Strength and joy fill his dwelling. O nations of the world, recognize the Lord. Recognize that the Lord is glorious and strong. Give to the Lord the glory he deserves. Bring your offering and come into his presence. Worship the Lord in all his splendor. Let all the earth tremble before him. The world stands firm and cannot be shaken. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. Tell all the nations the Lord reigns. Amen. Let's worship him this morning.
Let's continue worshiping him this morning. You may be seated. 
So once more, welcome to First Alliance Church. We're so happy that you are here, uh, continuing with what kind of has been a little more of what's become a new normal for the for using the live stream and for giving and stuff like that. I feel like I have to put on like a a Disney flight attendant person, and so it's like no eating, no drinking, no smoking. If you walk down your aisles to the main hallway, to the very end, there's a box on each side. In that box, you may deposit an envelope or monies. Now, if you would like to continue to give online, there's a slide. <laughs> if you read said slide, it'll tell you how to do so. But most importantly, I just w want to, to let you know that um, and, and I'm sorry that I'm a little distracted. I'm genuinely so happy to see, to see you guys. <laughs> feel like I'm like a puppy. Like I don't even know. I might start even speaking in Spanish. Like who knows? Who knows what happens from uh, here on out? So I'm gonna do what's usually best and give the floor to God. So let's pray. <laughs> uh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much once more for the gift of being able to meet today and knowing that there's still many churches that still cannot meet. Uh, there's still a lot of local expressions of your body that uh, cannot meet. And so, Lord, uh, who knows what, what the future holds or anything, but I can just say that I am thankful for this moment right here, right now, that we get to do this right here, right now, Lord. Uh, and so I just ask that you continue to bless this time, Lord. Bless the offering. Uh, bless um, those who give, Lord. May they give with a good intent in their heart, not to be seen, not to be noticed, not conditionally, but truly knowing that, everything comes back to you, Lord. And so it's an expression of worship in this moment. So Lord, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's continue worshiping him.
today, Father. I'm so thankful that we can hold on to those words, that you have never failed us. And knowing that you make promise after promise in Scripture, and you are good on your word. We know the Scripture says that he who promises is faithful. And Lord, you are faithful. And so, Lord, in this moment, remind us of your greatness. Remind us of your goodness. Remind us of your faithfulness. And Lord, let that truth sink into our hearts so that when hardship comes, we may know how to resist the devil, resist temptation, as we continue to submit to you, Lord. So Lord, we pray this in your holy name, the name above all names. And once more, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in person. Pray this in your holy name. And God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Good morning to you. There's people here. I'm so glad there's people here. Uh, let's, so this is how this is going to work today. If you're on site, I am so excited that you are here. If you are joining us online, I'm excited that you're there. Now, you have an advantage online that the crowd in here doesn't. You have all those emojis, so when you think something's funny, you can do a smiley face emoji. When you think something's, oh, that really hits your heart, you can give the little heart emoji and thumbs up and all that. Don't make angry face emojis. Nobody wants that. But, uh, you know, you have all that. So in the room, if you're on site, I'm going to need you, uh, you no longer have an emoji, so if it's funny, laugh. <laughs> You've been used to being at home just clicking a button, so if it's funny, you laugh. If, if, if it's something that speaks to you, you can say amen, or you can just give me one of those. So right where you are, just give one, a, go ahead, tr try it. Can everybody do a little sunset hard hands? No, can you do that? A, little heart, there's a big heart back there, that's good. You can give me thumbs up, whatever. So we're all going to do this together, and we're going to enjoy as we jump back in. I am so thrilled that you are here loving this moment. Happy Father's Day to you, all of our daddies. Let's just say thank you, God, for all of our daddies. So grateful for them. Well, today we are beginning, uh, it's fitting that we're coming back together on Father's Day, um, because there can be no better father 
than God the Father. So as we come back today, we're starting a brand new series. We're going to jump into a letter. The next few weeks, we're going to stay in one spot. A letter from a guy by the name of Paul. Paul wrote and led in the early church, wrote several letters to different churches all over. And you can go ahead and start flipping if you want to. If you've got um, your app or your Bible, whatever, at home or in here, go ahead and flip to 1 Corinthians is where we're going to be. I'll give you exactly where in just a moment and you can let me know you've got it. But before we dive into that letter from Paul, maybe you've experienced this before. Just feel free to wave at me. Give us a thumbs up. Maybe you can type it in online if you've experienced this before. But um, there was an occasion not too long ago where my sweet wife, who is an amazing cook, she's one of those that can take a recipe from Pinterest and then turn it into something that is like better than what you read on Pinterest. I'm just blessed. That's all there is to it. My oldest son is starting to take after that. He's starting to learn how to take these ideas and cook. So it's great for me uh, as a man who enjoys food because, you know, I just get to sit around and people cook. But every now and then something happens where it doesn't quite work out as planned. Uh, there was an occasion not long ago where my wife came up with this recipe. She found this recipe for a breakfast muffin. Now, let me be very clear. When I say breakfast muffin, I mean something more akin to the entirety of a breakfast buffet crammed into something the size and shape of a muffin. Are y'all with me? You know what I'm talking about? So she reads this recipe and I'm just like, yes, praise God. God, that is from heaven. Do they call it manna? Let's eat it. So she says, I'm going to fix this. Saturday's coming. I'm so excited. I am thrilled about this. Saturday morning, she gets up early. She goes to make this just piece of heaven in a muffin tin. She comes into the room. I'm, I'm in the bedroom. She comes in there. And I hear these words. Smell this. <laughs> now... If you know anything about the human condition, if someone comes to you and says the words, smell this, uh, the fact of the matter is whatever you're about to smell is probably something you don't want to smell, okay? So she comes in, she says, smell this, and what we discovered is that apparently the sausage did not want to cooperate with the expiration date that had been printed on the package. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? So we still had four weeks according to this package, and yet she comes in and says, smell this, and I just, I mean, it was just, it was bad. That bothered some of y'all. Some of y'all just went, ooh, don't do that, Pastor. Now listen, it was horrible. So she said, you know what? I'll just go ahead and try to make it without the sausage. She might as well have said, let me try to make this without bacon because any recipe that requires bacon and you take the bacon out, you ruined it. <laughs> Same thing with the sausage. She says, let me just try to make it. She puts them in front of us. My sweet kids, myself, we're all sitting at the table. And we all pick one up and we take a bite. And it it was not good. It was just not good. It was bad. That's all there was to it. Even my wife took a bite, picked up her napkin, and did that real discreet southern ladylike thing where you just <laughs> right back into the napkin. She said, okay, who wants a Pop-Tart? You know, that was it. It was just bad. And, and what we found out is that the reason it was bad is really that sausage was the key ingredient to giving it flavor, to adding a little bit of moisture to it because these things were dry as could be. That sausage is what was needed to make it work. Maybe you've experienced that before. Maybe you've experienced that before. Making bread and you forgot to put in the activating ingredient. And so you end up with something that just looks like, you know, styrofoam. Maybe you've had a recipe that you've cooked like that. But here's the thing. The same holds true in life. What we're going to do as we begin this series, the next several weeks, we're going to discover the key ingredient. That one thing that brings us alive. That one thing that gives meaning to everything else that we do. That one thing that gives life to the things that we say that so 
powerfully shapes every single interaction we have with others in this life. The one thing that changes everything. As we unpack what it means to lead with love. To lead with love. A message that I think we desperately need in our culture today. In our society today. To get back to a place where we have an understanding of love. And not, not just any kind of love as we're going to see here in just a second. But, but a love that is bigger than ourselves. That is beyond us. So, in order to dive into this, we're going to look for the next few weeks at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I actually get to hear some of you do it in person. For those of you online, make sure to type it in. Once you've got it, let me know. Got it, Nate. 1 Corinthians. Yes! I love it so much. I'm so happy. Good. Good, you got it. If you, if you got it online, that's fantastic. Let us know. Just make that mention in the comments. 1 Corinthians 13. And we're just going to read a few verses, okay? We're just going to read verse 1 through verse 3 today. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. Look at this. Paul says to us, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, the language of men and angels, if I'm able to communicate beyond my own ability, but have not what? Good. I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Next, he writes, and if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not what? I am nothing. And then in verse 3, if I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Now, many of you are familiar with some of the songs across the decades that make a declaration of our need for love. Maybe you remember the Beatles, right? The Beatles had a song that was, all you need is, that's it, man. That's all you need is love, brother. There was another one that uh, was written by Mr. Bacharach. It was sung by several different people, but it went, uh, what the world needs now is love. sweet love, right? And there's some that we've heard in a more modern era, this declaration of our need, our desire, the world's need and the world's desire for more love. And there is no message that could be more true. But the catch is we need to understand this. We don't need a love that is emotion driven. What we don't need more of is an emotional response in our world today. Because if you're anything like me, we've seen the emotional responses. And it's not that those are bad, but we need something deeper, something more that's beyond that. And that's exactly what we see here in, in Paul's words. He's talking about something that is more than just an emotion, more than just an emotional response. And he is speaking to the fact that we do need it, that we do need love. You may know this already if you've grown up in church at all, you may be familiar. If not, you've probably even seen it uh, this past year during the Super Bowl. There was a great commercial put together by an insurance company. They did a commercial that actually highlighted these four Greek words, something that these people who were hearing Paul's letter would have been familiar with. There are four words. The, the, I'm not going to preach these, but just highlight them. Four different words they used to convey love. The first one was eros, okay? Eros love. It's a romantic love, okay? It's the, it's the kind of love that Michelle has for me, <laughs> right? On the days when I behave myself. And it's the kind of love I have for you, baby. Mwah. Anyway, y'all are getting uncomfortable. You're like, ooh, Stop. Eros, it's a romantic love. Then there's, then there's phileo or filio love. 
You familiar with that? We know that one, the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, right? And that's what that speaks to, phileo or filio love, is, is a companionship, a deep companionship, a love for a brother. Then there's storge, right? It's a familial love. It's a, hey, do we have any grandparents in the room? Any grandparents watching online? Yeah? It, it's, that, it's that affection that you have for your grandbabies, you know? I hear that there's nothing like it. One day, far, far, far off from now, one day I'll get to experience that. But it's that affection that you have for family, that connection that you feel. But then there's this word that Paul uses for us that we have from the the Greek manuscripts, that we get this letter from which we translate this letter. And it is this word here for love. And it is agape. Okay? Okay. Many of you already knew that. Maybe some of you online, you knew that one already. But agape, what it is, is it represents, in the Greek language, it represents the highest form of love. It describes a kind of love, hear me, that's willing to forfeit one's own rights. It's the kind of love that's willing to forfeit one's own rights for the good of another. It's, it's action-oriented. It requires movement. It requires decisions. It requires that we do something. It's a love that would even go so far as to lay down one's own life for the good of another. And it's this word that Paul speaks of as he says, if I have not love, if I have not love. It wasn't commonly used before the first century. And yet over and over and over again, what we see with New Testament writers is that they set this forth as the highest virtue, the key ingredient that brings life to life, love. So the question that we're going to wrestle with as we look at this agape love, this action-oriented selfless love, is what would our relationships with our children, with our spouse, with our coworkers, our neighbor, even our enemy, what would those relationships look like if we chose to lead with love? If we chose to lead our conversations, not seeking to be right, but to lead with love and arrive at a place where we recognize that we're both here doing this life together, whether it's our spouse, whether it's our kids, whether it's someone we don't even like. What if we just chose to lead our homes and our places of influence, every conversation, forfeiting our rights for the good of another, laying down our agenda, That's what we're going to talk about these next few weeks. And to get it started, we're going to take our cue from Paul and we're first going to look at what life is, what our gifts, our abilities, all of that, what our life is without love. And the first thing that we want to see is this. Without love, my words are obnoxious. Look at somebody beside you. Don't breathe in their face. Rona. Okay. Look at somebody beside you and say, obnoxious. Okay, try it again because y'all, y'all, y'all are the late service. You get to be awake. You at home, look at somebody in your house, type it in, and do it kind of obnoxiously. Just look at them and say, obnoxious. That was a little better. My words are obnoxious. Look at what Paul says here in that first verse of verse 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging symbol. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels. Now, without question, what Paul is doing here, you have to remember, we have chapter divisions when, when we read through these letters. But Paul just wrote it as one continuous thought. Okay, As someone was reading in the local church, this was just one thought. So this idea of if I speak in tongues of men and angels is directly connected to what Paul was just telling us, what he was just teaching about, okay? 
So prior to that verse in chapter 12, Paul is talking about the diversity of gifts within the local church, the same spirit that gives all of those gifts. So it's not, this isn't just a passage that's like sweet for weddings, all right? It's good because it fits, but it's about life on a larger scale. So he's just talked about things like words of knowledge. He's just talked about great faith. He's just talked about administration, the gift of administration. He's just talked about teaching. And here, as we read, he's just talked about tongues or languages. Now, this makes us a little nervous sometimes because we're like, ooh, what are we getting into here? Paul is essentially just saying this, okay? There is an ability a gift of communication that comes that, that might allow us to speak and, and not know what language it is that is being spoken, but someone else understands the message, okay? So let's just kind of baseline it right there so we know what we're talking about. The real question is, why is it that he starts with this? Why were the people of Corinth so obsessed with this idea of tongues or of languages. And to understand that, we have to go to the culture of the city. Because remember, this is about more than just that. It's about life in general. And Paul knew who he was speaking to. This church was located in the city called Corinth. Corinth was located. Does anybody want to make a guess in what country Corinth was located? Anybody? Anybody? Turkey? Somebody said Turkey. That's close. It's good. Somebody, did somebody say Greece? Greece. So Corinth was in Greece. All right. Not only was it in Greece, Corinth was actually a cultural hub and a major trade center within Greece. Now you say, Nate, what does that have to do with speaking in tongues of men and of angels? I'll tell you. Because the Greeks placed a high priority on oral expression and communication. Speech was at the forefront of everything that these people did. The Greeks were all about, whether it be education, politics, debate, entertainment, it was all about communication. It was all about speaking to others. And so, as we look at this, we can see that Paul even uses a little bit of that tactic to make sure that, you know, that they're connecting, that they're, there's an understanding with them, okay? Aristotle, how many of you have heard that name before? You know, Aristotle, the great Greek philosopher, right? Aristotle actually taught, he defined, refined, and taught public speaking known as the art of rhetoric, all right? And I know y'all like, this is a lot of history. Hang with me, it'll make sense. He taught rhetoric, and rhetoric was just an oral expression. It was just speaking in order to persuade others of truth. It was speaking to refute an argument. So Paul even uses that tactic. Have you ever heard someone say, let me ask you a rhetorical question? That's where it comes from. Right before Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, he asks a bunch of rhetorical questions. He says, are all prophets? Are all apostles? Can all work miracles? Are all teachers? The answer to every one of those questions was already no. Not everybody's a teacher. Not everybody works miracles. So Paul is using this to help them understand the place of language. So for the people of Corinth, where communication was priority, now you take in the local church where God actually gives gifts that lets you, a tongue that lets you communicate even beyond what you could before. They were fascinated by this. But then Paul breaks down the culture. Paul breaks down even the gifts. And he says this, essentially. Without love, even if I ascend to the place 
where I can communicate with any being, whether on earth or in the heavens, without love, it's just noise. That's it. All of our words are just noise. He even goes so far as to use the illustration by saying, if I speak in those languages of men and of angels, if I could speak to anybody, but I don't do it in love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. I'm going to get the help of our drummer today that was up here. I love that it's Father's Day and my boy was on the drums. That is awesome getting to see him back there, but I'm going to get his help, okay? Because I want you to get this illustration. I want you to understand this. All right, buddy, give me a, give me a slick 4-4, four, four, uh, kick on one and three. Give me about three or four measures and crash on the one at the end. Go for it. There you go. Plain and simple, right? That was good. You did good. I like to make him feel awkward. It's my role as a father. Um, so did you catch it? Did you catch that symbol? Right. <laughs> he thinks he's funny. Little rim shot there. Um, did you catch the symbol right on the end? Just an accent. Just added a little something to it, right? Now, Benjamin, go ahead and give me nothing but uh, some eights just on the crash symbol. Just nonstop. Just go. Just go after it. That's good. You can stop. That's what it's like having a drummer in your house. If anybody was ever wondering, get out. Just good job, buddy. Good job. Listen. You hear that noise, all of a sudden everything changes. What was there as an accent, what made sense, now just becomes what? Obnoxious. It's just noisy. And see, again, Paul, a master of getting the idea across, he said this because he knew within this culture, the Corinthians had a perfect picture in mind when he said, without love, your words are just a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. Because at this time, those who worshiped other gods, those who participated in pagan rituals, the, the priests of those pagan traditions and religions, they would actually at the temple, temple just hold out cymbals and brass and just bang on it nonstop. And so when the Corinthians heard those words, all they could hear in their ma- minds was the incessant, irritating, ongoing, hollow sound of that brass being beaten upon as people were worked into a frenzy. And so it is our words without love. Loud, empty, and hollow. Nothingness. So without love, my words are obnoxious. But secondly, without love, the miraculous is meaningless. You say, what? The miraculous? That sounds kind of, I didn't say it, actually. Paul said it. Without love, the miraculous is meaningless. Look again at what he says, verse 2. In speaking of all of these gifts, he says this, And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, he goes on, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. So here, Paul lists off several gifts that would be viewed as supernatural in nature, that would be miraculous, okay? He walks through every single one of these, and he starts off by speaking of the prophetic, right? The ability to to speak forth or speak out a word directly from God. Maybe it brought to their minds images of uh, Samuel and Isaiah and Elijah. Maybe that's who they thought of when he spoke of prophetic powers. But then he goes on and talks about more of these miraculous gifts and miraculous abilities. And he says again, catch this. He starts using some of that rhetorical speech again, exaggerating 
in order to kind of drive home the point. He says, and if I have prophetic powers, if I understand, what's that word? All. If I understand all mysteries and have all knowledge. Who can understand all mysteries? Who has all knowledge? God, but not us. Now, do we have access to those? Does God give us glimpses and understanding and knowledge that's beyond our own ability? Yes, no doubt. That's not what we're debating. But Paul is saying, if I have the ability to understand all mysteries, how the universe came about, how Jesus was able to give his life for every single one of us, the great plan of redemption for mankind, if I were able to understand every single bit of that, none of us can understand all of that. I mean, here's the thing, folks. I still live in a world where I'm trying to figure out how Facebook knows what I'm shopping for before I know what I'm shopping for. Are y'all with me? I still live in a world where I say to Michelle, I wonder where I could find some stone-washed planks. And Facebook is like, found it. It's creepy. Some of us in this life are still struggling to understand how a thermos knows to keep cold things cold and hot things hot. Some of y'all never even thought about that and I just ruined the rest of your day because you're like, how does it know? So to say anything about understanding all mysteries, nobody can, but he says, even if you could, even if you were so spiritually gifted that you understood all of it, If you don't have love, you got nothing. If you don't have love, all of that understanding is just useless information. My older brother, um, who I like to tease and make fun of, and uh, we've had an interesting journey as brothers over our years. But my brother, I'll just say it, don't tell him I said this. If you're watching online, please don't share this with him because it'll just make his head blow up. He's a genius. My brother is an absolute genius. He is one of those guys that he'll play it off like he's not very smart. If you were to just sit down with him at a dinner, he's pretty unassuming and you would be like, oh, well, you know, seems like a nice guy. But he is extremely smart. One of those guys that was just, he's able to absorb information like a sponge, which makes him, in addition to being smart, A trivia buff. Any of you trivia buffs in here, like you play Jeopardy and everybody else is like, well, you just shut up. We know you'll know all the answers, right? Any of you? Nobody's going to admit to that. Anybody online? Okay. So here's the thing. He's a trivia buff. One of his favorite games growing up was Trivial Pursuit. You remember that one? The one where you got the little pie and you fill it with all the shapes. He would destroy everybody. Nobody was ever as good as he was. He's the type of guy, I texted him the other day just to test this theory, right? He didn't have to think about it. He didn't have to process it. There was nothing in him that said, why are you asking me this? I just texted him the other day and I said, hey, Josh, uh, just share with me the first random thing that pops into your head. Not even a minute passed. He types me back. He was like, did you know the human head weighs eight pounds? Why do you know that? What's wrong with you? That like, this is just a random thing in your brain. Anyway, that was trivia with him growing up. That was watching Jeopardy. That was playing that game. And I can't count how many times we would think, there's no way he knows this. And we would ask the question and he would know it. And we would go, how do you know that? Every time to this day, he'll respond with this. Well, I am a veritable cornucopia of useless information. (laughs) That's it. That's what he has to say about it. And see, here's the thing. That right there, No matter how much understanding we have, whether in the natural or in the spiritual, just like my brother, when separated from love, it's just useless information. It's just pointless and meaningless. 
Paul goes on. Let's look at that verse again. He moves on from prophetic powers and from all mysteries. And he even says, even if I have all faith, there he goes again, all faith to remove mountains. Even though Jesus himself said that faith the size of a mustard seed. Y'all know how big a mustard seed is? It's little. Even if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can do amazing things. But Paul says, even if you have so much faith that it's like breathing to you. That you can look at a mountain, whether literal or metaphorical, you can look at a mountain and say, move. And it just happens. And this is where it gets harsh. He doesn't just say, even if you have all faith, but no love, it means nothing. Look at what he says. If I have all faith, all prophetic powers, all understanding, and I have not love, I, what? Am nothing. Aren't you glad you came to church today to get encouraged? Bless it. Paul just gets real and brutal. He's like, I don't care if you can do every bit of this. If you separate it from love, it's not just that it means nothing. You are nothing. The, the modern translation would be Paul saying, you can do all this great stuff, but if you don't have love, you're just a jerk. That's how harsh it is. It's brutal. It's hard to process, but he boils it down so simply for us that even if we can do this, we have no identity apart from love, self-sacrificing, willing to lay down our rights, our agenda for the good of another. And then Paul says this, without love, my words are obnoxious. Without love, the miraculous means nothing. Without love, my sacrifice is worthless. My sacrifice is worthless. Look what he says in verse 3. But if I give away all that I have, if I give all of it, and I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. I profit nothing. And we push back at that, or at least I do, maybe you don't. I push back at that because I hear that. If I give away all that I have, like that means the house, the cars, that means all the purses, baby. No, that, that means all the shoes. That means every last red cent. If I give all of that away without love, it's still nothing. And Paul says, yeah, exactly. We push back because that kind of feels like agape, doesn't it? If I'm giving away everything, surely that's me laying it down. Surely that's me saying that somebody else matters. But the reason Paul goes here is because I think he knew then. And I think that God knew for us now that our giving isn't always motivated by love, right? Is it okay? Sometimes we come in here and it feels like we're getting picked on, that like Paul or Jesus or, you know, whoever's just picking on us. Let's just pick on the institution called the church for a minute, okay? Not the church that's the gathering of people, the institution, okay? Because here's the thing. Many times, if you've experienced this, if you've experienced it watching online, just wave at me. I have had occasions where I have given purely out of guilt. Nobody else? Man, I'm a hellion, y'all. What is wrong with me? No, I, I think we can relate on some level. There have been those occasions. Listen, it's that thing where we've made a, a big transition, not just because of a virus, but because it's something we're going to do. Andy mentioned earlier, if you came today prepared to give, you know, you can pull an envelope out of the chair back, but you can drop it off in those boxes at the, the corners way out in the lobby there, okay? Drop it off in there, or you can give online. One of the things that pops into my mind is thinking about the passing of a plate. You ever been there before? Where like they're passing the plate and you know it's coming to you. And you're like, oh man. And you see that one dude down the row that puts in a roll of 20s that you're like, I don't know what he does, but I need to get to know him. But it comes to you and you like, okay, let me see what I got. And you pull out, you take a one and fold it up 
the best you can so that nobody knows that that's what it is. Don't quit being so holy. You know what I'm talking about. And you toss it in there. You, you give because it's coming and like you feel like you have to. Now, does that mean that's the way we always give? No, certainly not. I know so many of you are faithful to give because you love God, you love his church, you love people. But sometimes we give out of guilt. Sometimes we, we give because we're motivated by fear. I, I grew up in church. So for me, I grew up in a culture where I heard things that basically boiled down to, you know, if you don't give, especially in church, if you don't give, God will get it one way or another. Right? All four tires blow out on the car at the exact same time. Well, should have given. Wouldn't have happened. The washer turns into some kind of creature that's walking across your laundry room. And you're like, well, if you'd have given, Jesus would have protected you from that. We give out of fear sometimes. And sometimes we give motivated by potential reward. What we will get back if we give. What we, we give back for recognition. See, what Paul is saying here is, listen, you can go to the grocery store and you can see that young mom with three kids that she's trying to wrangle all by herself and you know it's been a rough day and you can say, I want to take care of her groceries. But if you give that and it's so that you can be seen for the act that you just did, just don't. Because separate from motivation by love. And here, again, it just gets even more weighty because Paul goes on and he doesn't just speak about the giving. And I know you're like, well, nobody gives everything out of guilt. Right, but remember, Paul's trying to make a point. It's about the motivation. And he goes even further and he says, not just if I give all that I have, but if I deliver my body up to be burned. If I willingly go the way of a martyr, but it's not driven by love, then it profits nothing. Let's do, let's do some math this morning, kind of close it out. All the overachievers, don't get ahead of me, okay? But let's do some math up here. It's quick math, it's not hard, okay? But you just shout out the answer. Everybody participate online, go ahead and type it in real fast. Um, But here we go. You ready? Don't get ahead of me. Here we go. You ready? Let's do this together. 10 times 1 equals? Good job. Let's see if you were right. Good job. Give yourselves a hand. You can do 10 times 1. All right, next up. Let's do this next one. 20 times 2. Go. Good job. Y'all are good with the math. I like it. Okay, let's go ahead and do one more again. I told you. Quick maths. Here we go. Last one. 100 times 100. Go. Good job. You even got it on that one. Here we go. Now, that makes sense, right? This is natural. Everybody gets this. But let's take it over here. Because Paul speaks of what we give without love. What we sacrifice without love. Our willingness to lay something down not motivated by love. This one's easy. Let's just go ahead and answer them all at once. What's the answer? Zero. Zero. That's hard for us because in our minds, we think there should at least be a one-to-one correlation, don't we? We think at the very least, well, if I gave 10 bucks to the church, that's better than nothing. There's at least a one-to-one connection here. 10 times 1, that's 10. I did $10 worth of a good thing. I gave. But Paul says, no, 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 no. If you gave $10 and you gave it for any reason other than you were just moved by a self-sacrificing love, it means nothing. If you give to that young mom, if you give to that local organization, but in any of those cases, you want recognition, you want an acknowledgement, you want something that says, hey, great job. If it's motivated by anything but love, it profits nothing. We gain nothing. All the gifts, all the good deeds, every noble work is zeroed out. And we don't even end with that which we began. If you break it down, Paul is saying this. 
Life without love. A willingness to lay down my agenda. A willingness to lay down myself. Life without love is nothing. It's just like, go all the way back to the beginning. It's just like that breakfast muffin, right? That breakfast muffin without the sausage was good for the trash. It's about it. That's us without love. If we don't have that connection, if we don't have that that depth of desire within us to say, listen, I want to lay down my rights for the good of another. And I want you just to imagine with me, back to our question, what would our world look like? What would your world look like if you chose to lead with love? What would it look like if we said, I'm going to lay myself down for the good of another? This idea of leading with love, it's not emotional. It's not just a response. It's something that will change the world around us radically. Because when love enters the equation, now it's not a one-to-one. Now what was 10 becomes 100. What was 100 becomes 10,000. What was 10,000 becomes Countless on end, lives affected, hearts changed. Imagine what our society would look like, our churches would look like if we chose to lead with love, not leading to be right, not leading to push a a political agenda or ideology, but just chose to say, I just want to lead with love. Every conversation, every interaction. I don't just think I know that the impact would be immeasurable. Without love, I'm noisy. But when love leads the way, my words can be heard with clarity. They can be received. Without love, I am am nothing. I'm stripped of my identity without love. But when love leads the way and I use my gifts and my understanding, I can make a difference and lead with purpose. Without love, I profit nothing. But with love, as I give of my resources, my time, my life, countless other lives are changed. And I want to bring it all the way back around because the fact of the matter is the greatest example of agape that the world has ever known was that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That his son gave his life willingly for us. Let's make a conscious decision to lead with that kind of love. Amen. So what do we do with this? What's the action for for this week? First of all, I want to encourage you every single morning, right after you get out of bed, read 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 8. Every single day. Like, Nate, I don't like it when you do this whole read this passage every single day. Listen, this is what I know. It takes time to develop habits. And if we're willing to commit every single day to read a passage that its entire focus is what love really looks like, maybe, just maybe, some of it will actually start to stick. Maybe we'll begin to identify those characteristics And that's another thing you should do this week. Start writing down the things that jump out at you in that passage. Love is what? Patient. It's kind. It's not self-seeking. Holds no record of wrongs. Start jotting those things down. And watch as they begin to work their way into your lives if you'll let them. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 8, every day. Start writing down the things you see there. Make something like this your daily prayer. You don't have to write this down exactly, but 
This is my prayer. God, I want more of my life to be filled with more of your love. I want to lead with love in my home, my spheres of influence, and every conversation. Amen. That's the prayer I'm going to be praying every day through this series. God, I want more love to fill my life. Let me lead my conversations, my family, those in my spheres of influence with love. Ask yourself this question this week. This is a good one, real practical from our first point. What area in your life are you just being a clashing symbol? A noisy gong? Just maybe talking without love, speaking, using language without love? Just throw it out there. I won't tell you where it is. You just pray about it. But let's take action on this. Let's be a people who lead with love. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for these folks. I thank you for those who are gathered together in this place, those who are gathered online. The opportunity simply to have this time with one another is so precious. And we don't ever want to take it for granted. But God, we also don't want it to be a time that's just an assignment during our week, an obligation that we tend to. We want it to be something that when we leave from this place or when we close our browser, that we embrace a life changed by you. God, if there's one in this room, if there's one online today, that they don't know the personification of love, Jesus Christ. And today they want to start that relationship with you. They want to ask forgiveness for their sins and they want to be led by you. Lord, if they're in this room or they're watching online, I pray that they wouldn't leave from today without letting us know so that we can help them begin that walk, that relationship with you. If you're here in this room today and that's you, come see me before you leave. Let me tell you how you can start a relationship with Jesus. If you're online, shoot me a message, an email from our website. Shoot me a message right there on Facebook. But God, for every single one of us, awaken a desire to pursue a sacrificial love. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. It was awesome to see your faces this week. Awesome to be with you online this week. I want to encourage you, take care of yourself, okay? Stay healthy. I look forward to seeing you again. And the only way that we can do that is if you stay healthy, all right? So know that you are prayed for this week. Know that you are loved. If you need anything, don't ever hesitate to call us. Have a great week. We'll see you again soon.